Hi, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Aspen Ideas Festival. My name is Marina Corrin, and I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic, where I cover space exploration. And I'm glad to be here in conversation with Sarah Stewart Johnson, a planetary scientist and the author of The Sirens of Mars, Searching for Life on Another World. Sarah, how are you? Oh, I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, Marina. Yeah. Where are you beaming in from? I'm actually calling in from Kentucky, where I grew up. I've been spending part of the summer with my family here. Nice. Any signs of Mars around you in Kentucky? Uh, just in the night sky. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very interesting. I've been spending a lot of the summer spending time with my children, and they, uh, they're getting very interested in space at this age. They're six and eight years old. Oh yeah, that's a great a great time to incept them with the your your Mars interest for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Marina has been trying so hard to to get them interested in Mars. They're so interested in Jupiter and Saturn. They say these are my favorite planets, Mama, and I think they're doing it just to troll me. But <laughs> yeah, so when they're ready, they can read Sirens of Mars and know what you're talking about, um, uh, which is a great book. I really enjoyed it. And I, I want to uh, pick out one anecdote from the, from the book. You wrote about NASA's early Viking missions to Mars. And you wrote that when scientists back on Earth took a look at the data that was coming in from those missions, um, they got really excited. Like at, at JPL, they sent out for champagne um, because there was an experiment on one of these spacecraft that was designed to detect organic molecules. Um, and they thought that they found something. They thought that they found evidence of life quietly metabolizing in the Martian soil, but it turned out that they were wrong. And I remember reading that and feeling so disappointed. And that was in 1976, I believe. So I'm wondering what that realization was like and what did it mean at the time? Uh, such a, a poignant moment. I mean, here we were, like the community was undertaking this this huge experiment, you know, it had been built the greatest experiment in the history of modern science to actually try to do life detection on the surface of another planet for the very first time. And that signal that first came back from this labeled release experiment was so exciting. You know, there was just this enormous response and it seemed to be like hitting all of the criteria that had been set out before launch as, you know, the criteria for finding life. But it was just something that, that peaked and then fell away very quickly, and then taken in concert with the other biological experiments that have been done, as well as the, there's a chemical instrument on board that found no traces whatsoever of organic matter, the sort of organic carbon that would be the building blocks of life as we know it. You know, that started to look a lot more like chemical oxidation as opposed to a biological reaction. And, and I think that feeling of disappointment was just very palpable for the people involved in that mission. You know, some of the old timers that I talked to when I was doing research for the book described it to me. And I just think there was so much excitement and we'd never even touched down on the surface of Mars before. So who knew, who knew, you know, some of the first images were of the foot of the lander just to make sure it wasn't going to sink all the way, you know, just to really understand if the surface was going to be the kind of surface that, you know, had been hypothesized. Um, and there were just so many I don't know. I mean, we see this again through the history of Mars exploration, all these twists and turns. We've been, you know, guiding, going down all these blind alleys and, and finding all these things that we just never sort of expected. Um, but, you know, after those Viking missions, after that last, you know, radio wave oscillated to Earth in 1982, we just went into this very fallow period where there were no missions for almost two decades. And, and, um, I think it's one of the most exciting things now that we're finally starting to go after those big questions again, like could there have been life on Mars? And why was there that uh, 20 year hiatus and how did then we get out of that and NASA start going back to Mars because it's, it's all over Mars right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's an exciting time to be a Mars scientist. We've got all these missions and all this data. Um, and it's just been such a difference, you know. So the, since 1997, every 26 months when the planets line up on the same side of the sun, NASA sent missions, and it's been so exciting. But, you know, for that period, you know, from the late 70s to the late 90s, there was nothing. I mean, there was one attempted mission, a big NASA mission called the Mars Observer that failed catastrophically three days from reaching Mars, lost communication. 
And, you know, so many of these Mars missions have failed, you know, almost half of them have failed, but that was going to be a big flagship mission and it was just a devastating loss. But I think there were other factors at play too. And some people would certainly argue that, you know, the, the disappointing results from Viking, there was just, you know, if we had found some very intriguing signals, I think there would have been an immediate follow-up because, because nothing sort of came back that was indicative of life. Mars just seemed like this old rusted husk of a planet. I think for a while there was a waning enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And how did the space community get that enthusiasm back? I mean, do we still? Well, I think, <laughs> um, I mean, there are a combination of factors. I mean, out of that fallow period, some really exciting things did happen. The sort of whole science of astrobiology, a lot of those scientists, a lot of those graduate students who had trained up on Viking, you know, turned their attention to our own planet and our own understanding of life really transformed. We began to realize that life was present in all of these places that we thought were lifeless. And if it would be present there in like the Antarctic dry valleys, maybe it would be present up on that Martian desert, even though it seemed so very barren when we arrived. Um, we also found out some really important things about biology that would have made us, if we were designing those Viking life detection experiments now, we would design them very differently than we would have designed them then. You know, we were going after metabolism, but now we know that the vast majority of the diversity of life out there on our planet won't grow in a laboratory setting. You know, 99% of it won't grow and it won't grow in a little laboratory setting on Mars either. Um, so we kind of had these changes in how we go about things, but, you know, we also had a confluence of different people and different political forces, and, and we started this new program, Better, Faster, Cheaper, in 1997, which was, instead of having these big flagship missions, which could fail and fail so catastrophically, these smaller missions that were cheaper and had a lot more risk could go more often, and so that sort of got us back into the Mars game. Mm -hmm. And how did you get into the Mars game, or where did your interest in planetary science first begin? Oh, well, probably right around here in Kentucky. Um, so I grew up here, and my father was a bit of a, an amateur astronomer, an amateur geologist, and so we'd go look at road cuts, and we'd go out in our backyard, and he'd have this pair of binoculars, and we'd look up at the sky, and that was, you know, very... I don't know. I mean, even at the time, I'm not sure I would have said that like this was like what I was going to do. There were moments, especially when I was in middle school, where I just thought, oh, this is so dirty. You know? But then when I got off to college, like I just realized that these are the things that I was drawn to, you know, just these are the subjects that I found myself staying up at night reading about and thinking about. And, and it was just so exciting to sort of see them coalesce into a field and a, a path I could follow. And, and I think like a lot of people, you know, I, I met this professor in college who was a Mars scientist and he just, it just seemed so incredible and so fascinating what he was doing. And I started doing field work and he really took me under his wing. He was the deputy principal investigator on the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. And, you know, we were doing tests for the prototypes that would become those missions. And I just never done anything so exciting in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've done a lot of field work too. You've gone to Chile, Australia, Iceland, Antarctica. Um, which places felt to you, where did you feel closest to Mars? Because, you know, some of these places really do feel like another planet. Ah, they certainly do. I mean, it just feels like you're on the edge of the earth. I mean, there's nothing like touching down on the the ice runways there in Antarctica. I mean, you get out and it's just, there's no smell and the air just has this very different feeling and there's nothing. It's just the most incredible, complete vastness that you've ever experienced. And that, and that feels like you're touching down on the surface of another planet. It's just so entirely different and poignant and interesting and compelling. And it all just hits you right at once. I mean, I feel like those are the times I felt most like an astronaut. Um, but I mean, there have been other times, there are places like out in the Australian outback, um, you know, there's a particular place that I do some work on some really acidic salt lakes, the kind of environments that we might have had on Mars, you know, billions of years ago, and it was a place that was much more like the Earth. Um, and those, you know, it's just this dusty red desert and 
And it's, it's easy to forget that, you know, you're not actually there, that you're here on our planet instead. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, um, NASA has a new rover on the surface of Mars, as you know, the Perseverance mission, um, aptly named for, for the year we've all had for sure. Um, and, and that mission is looking for not evidence of present life, but evidence of ancient, long dead, fossilized life. Um, what kind of news or updates are you looking out for from that mission? Are you most excited to hear from that, that effort? Oh, well, it's been a really exciting few months. So Perseverance landed on Mars in February in this um, beautifully preserved uh, crater where there's this, um, this just exquisite river delta um, that dates back to 3.8 billion years ago. And so this is a place that is just a really exciting hunting ground to look for these signs, these ancient signs of life, these ancient biosignatures. Um, but in those couple of months since Perseverance landed, there's been a lot of what um, folks in the that work on science missions call commissioning, which is just sort of testing out these instruments. And it just takes so long to sort of make sure everything is working, make sure that everything is able to collect data, all the communication relays are, are going fine before you can really start the science campaigns. And there've been some really exciting things that have happened, like the Ingenuity helicopter, it's flown seven different times. You know, there are different instruments that have been able to turn on. Tens of thousands of pictures have already come back, but the real excitement is starting now. So um, Perseverance is heading off to this particular place. It's on the floor of the crater. It's about a mile and a half square. Um, and they're just, it's heavily cratered. And it's some of the most ancient terrain there. And so that's where Perseverance is really going to start its science campaign. Um, and one of the big goals of the mission is, is just this breathtakingly ambitious aim of collecting samples from the surface of Mars and bringing them back to Earth for folks to study in their laboratories. And I'm so hopeful that I might have the opportunity to study some of those samples myself in my laboratory at Georgetown. But so the first eight, up to eight samples are gonna be collected from these terrains on the crater floor. And I'm just so excited to see when those first samples start getting selected and what kinds of terrains and then next, Perseverance will come back. And the thing that I, I guess is even more exciting than that for me is to finally then go off to the edge of the Delta. Again, this place where, you know, I think we have really a much sort of better chance of sort of looking again for those kinds of ancient biosignatures than just the crater floor. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And so those, those sample tubes that NASA wants to bring back in a, in a whole other series of missions that are still in the works, um, once those come back to Earth, once they've entered the atmosphere, gone through whatever complicated customs process that extraterrestrial shipments have to go through, and you know, you and other scientists get these samples in the lab, open them up, and you discover that there is nothing in there but plain old Martian soil, we're kind of back to that moment in the 1970s. Um, what would happen then? What would that mean? Oh, so that's certainly a possibility, you know, it's still, you know, more likely than not that we would have something like that come up. I mean, so one thing that I think we all have to keep in mind is, you know, there's this huge terrain on Mars and Mars is every bit as complex and enigmatic as our own planet. And we are collecting samples from Jezero Crater, which is, you know, a very exciting, interesting place. You've got this wonderful river delta coming in. But there are also these possibilities that, you know, life on Mars, maybe it was never expressed at the surface in the same way that it was expressed here on Earth. What if photosynthesis never, you know, life never got far enough along to develop photosynthesis, which is why we have so much abundant surface biomass here. And also on Mars, you know, the magnetic field that was so protective from the radiation environment of space, it was lost early in its history. And, you know, maybe life just retreated underground. And it's one of these places that I'm most excited is to look at the Martian subsurface. And unfortunately, you know, Perseverance is only going to be able to drill a few centimeters down into the rock. And one of the things that, you know, we're thinking about a lot for future missions, these concepts of drilling much deeper and trying to get into this, I mean, there's a vast amount of our biomass here on our own planet that's in the subsurface and microbial form and those kind of subsurface biosignatures are something that, you know, we've been developing a lot of research around in my own lab group as well. So first I will say, I don't think the search ends, even if these surface samples don't have evidence of life in them. 
But even if, you know, a couple decades down the road, we've really scoured all these different places on Mars, there's still this enormous solar system, places like Enceladus and Europa and Titan, you know, exciting moons of the outer planets that could be habitable environments. And, and then even beyond that, you know, all of these extrasolar planets, you know, these exoplanets that are now being discovered by the thousands. And I just think the search will continue. Yeah. Yeah. And again, so let's say you don't find anything in those samples, and I don't mean to be a downer, but do you think that the planetary science community and NASA will enter another two-decade lull the way that it did after the Viking missions? Or will there be a push to go out to a different spot? I know earlier I said that NASA's all over Mars, but if you look at a map, like, a, you know, a, a stretched out map of Mars, there's still a lot of ground to cover, you know? Like, the terrain might be different in, in different areas of the planet, so would you want to make a case? Like, let's just go look somewhere else. It's not in Jezero Crater, but it might be somewhere else. I think so. I mean, one thing that is really different now than in the 1970s is it's not just the U.S. anymore, right? You know, there are all of these other countries that have you know, really vibrant space programs that are sending missions to Mars. And so there's a lot, there are a lot more players in the game. And so even if, you know, the U.S. decided to focus its attention elsewhere, there would still be other countries that have very strong ambitions to scientifically explore Mars and to really go after this question of life. Um, and again, I think that, you know, the way NASA is now structured, there are these different classes of missions, you know, discovery missions, research missions, you know, and, and there are different ways that things can get funded. We may even see missions being funded by the private sector in the next decade or two. I mean, I think there are lots of different modes of exploration that, you know, could be brought to bear um, on looking, looking at Mars and, you know, even if it is maybe a big flagship mission that you need to drill down to these places that I'm really excited to go looking for life in, um, you know, there are all these other ways that we could still tackle the planet and try to find, you know, new mysteries, new ways to discover things. Right. Yeah, definitely not just NASA anymore. Uh, I recently saw that the um, that China took a its spacecraft on the surface of Mars took a selfie, and it's really hard not to anthropomorphize these spacecraft. I saw that. I'm like, it looks so cute. Look at this little camera eye. <laughs> yeah. No, that's for sure. Uh, so there's uh, been a lot of attention paid recently to military reports of UFOs, and I promise this is going somewhere back to Mars. This is not just me asking you what you think of um, unidentified flying objects. Um, but all of this attention, it naturally sparks questions about whether aliens have visited Earth yet. And, you know, but in reality, it's far more likely that we're going to find, if we do find life beyond Earth, it's going to be in the form of microbes, um, maybe on Mars or maybe on the, the moons that you mentioned, you know, out in the solar system, potentially good candidates for astrobiology. Um, do you think that we could make that kind of discovery in our lifetimes? And what would that mean? Like, I, it's a hugely speculative question, but how close do you feel that the planetary science community is to a discovery like that? Oh, I think we're as close as we've ever been. I mean, one of the things that's so compelling about Mars is, you know, when we were just kind of flying blind back in the 1970s, we put in so much hard work, like really getting to know the place and trying to understand all of these things about it. And, and we, we have the context to really go after these questions in a much more rigorous, robust way than we did a few decades ago. Um, and when it comes to, you know, this question of, of what, what will come, what will, what we will take from all of this, like, it's just, it's just, it just seems like, so fundamental to be able to ask these things, you know, why are we here? Where did we come from? You know, why is there something and not nothing? And, and Mars gives us an opportunity to, to ask that question. And I'm a restless sort of person. And like, I really want to find an answer, you know, and there are all these different targets, but Mars is a place where I feel like we could do the very best science right now. And, um, and we have that context, we can go after these questions in such a you know, rigorous way. I'm just so excited. And I do think that it's possible that, you know, within my career, within my lifetime, and, and I just very much hope that I get to be a part of that discovery. It's just, you know, it's the thing that just really drives me just trying to understand 
you know, just like, is it just us in the context of just this huge cosmos? Are we bracketed by an abiotic before and an abiotic after? Are we just this ephemeral flash in the pan? Or are there other forms of life? And in some ways, it feels like a kind of immortality to me to sort of go after and know before I die that there is something that will, you know, even if our species, you know, will have a finite end and our planet will have a finite end. But if there are more sparks of life out there, I'll just find that very deeply satisfying. So that's at least what I hope. <laughs> and how would you hope that the, the public, you know, non-planetary scientists um, might react? Because you know, alien amoebas are less, you know, exciting in a way than alien engineers or just, you know, spaceships. We've just been so, um, you know, science fiction and, you know, media has, I think, prepared people to get news of, of life beyond Earth in a bigger way than we might actually get. You know, how would the public take you to the, you know, discovering, oh, there, there was life on Mars once, but it's been dead for billions of years. We're still alone. <laughs> I think the sort of key question, at least the thing that I'm so excited about, is this idea of a separate genesis. And even if it's something very simple, even if it's just a microbe, and again, microbes have dominated so much of our own history. You know, it's only very recently that we get, you know, complex life. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're sort of going after this, but just some new form of life. We only have one data point. All the life we've ever discovered is essentially the same thing you know it's carbon based it's dna based it's all you know can be tracked onto a phylogenetic tree and traced back to the same stuff but to have a second data point i mean it would just be so revolutionary and you know i write about this a lot in the book you know just trying to understand like why even just a simple microbe would just turn the world upside down and it would just change everything and if that second data point if that you know other spark of life if we find that in our own backyard just here in our own neighborhood you know over on mars just right there then i mean it just suggests that the whole universe it's just a hatchery of life and if it can lightning can strike twice just right together it just suggests that there are all kinds of just possibilities just so many possibilities um, and that's one of the things that I really do try to, to sort of explain in the book that just why this one discovery, even if it was something so simple, you know, just be so incredibly transformative and powerful, both, you know, for the scientific community, but also just kind of for humanity and, and what it means for our place in, in the universe. Right. And so in your research for the book um, and in your writing process, because it is, it's part memoir, too, about your experience um, getting closer to Mars in a sense. What was the most surprising part about the process of really diving into this topic and, and, and putting your thoughts to the page? Oh, I mean, I guess just how much was there? Like once I started writing, you know, I originally, I would go to these lectures, I'd be in, you know, conferences, and I would sort of write down these things, often at the back of like a notebook where I was taking notes. And there would just be all these things that would just never find expression on the pages of scientific journals, things that were just beautiful and evocative and just that would just really capture the human side of this search. Um, and I just felt like, you know, Myers sort of needed a different kind of treatment. And I started collecting some of these stories, some of these ideas, some of these things that I just found so beautiful and interesting about how, you know, how we've had this dawn of the space age and we built these contraption with human hands and we've sent them off to, you know, just the, as far as we could possibly imagine. And we're doing such incredible science, but just like to be able to see another world, like a world where you could like just scrape your knee that's so familiar, but at the same time, so indescribably foreign. Um, but I think the thing that surprised me is I thought, oh, maybe I could write a little essay. But once I, I started writing, you know, there was enough to, to fill a book and then even more, you know, <laughs> and it's just, there's so much, I think it tells us so much about ourselves, the way we've conducted this search the way we've reached out into the night to try to find these answers. And, and so many times we've seen kind of a reflection of ourselves. We've looked up at Mars and we've seen a sanctuary or a utopia or just some sort of envisioning of what 
you know, we, we most long for in our hearts. And I just find it all, I don't know, it just, I just, it just takes my breath away sometimes. And I think that that's why I was motivated to write the book. And I hope that people that read it sort of can take away some of that, some of that sort of magical feeling. Um, yeah. And, and so part of that vision of, of exploring Mars involves astronauts on the surface, um, which, you know, it, it kind of feels like the, for many people, it feels like the next natural destination for human beings. You know, we've, we've been to the moon, let's do Mars next. Um, and the motivations for that type of Mars exploration are very different than trying to find ancient fossilized life. Um, so I want to ask you something that I've been asking my sources a lot and hope that they don't get mad at me. But uh, why, <laughs> because it sounds like I'm questioning everything, why explore space at all? Or, you know, Mars and beyond, um, you know, whether with machines or with astronauts. Why, what, what for you are the most compelling and most animating reasons for going into the solar system in the next 10, 30, 50 years? Hmm. I mean, I think that there's something that really defines us as, as a people that defines humanity by reaching to the very edge of our grasp by just doing the hardest thing we can possibly do and asking the deepest questions we can possibly ask. And, you know, I, I think about like spending time with sort of my older relatives, you know, just, just, you know, around here. And it's just this sense of like, you know, that moment when the Apollo astronauts walked on the moon. I mean, it just seems like one of the most triumphant sort of things. And there was a unifying feeling too. I think people all over the world were watching that. And it was just extraordinary that we had the ingenuity and the ability to just go so very, very far. And we would bring back with us this new perspective of our, our fragile, vulnerable, little pale blue dot in the middle of this universe. And we really by going into space and looking back, you know, it really does emphasize just our own ephemerality and our own just smallness. And I think it's just, it, it's really important. And I think it can really bring people together in, in a really important way. Um, and so I think that, you know, exploring space, you know, people say, you know, it's for glory, it's for political reasons, you know, it's to start, you know, like, having this whole new economy in space i just for me it's just something that's that's much more sort of fundamental about what it means to be human like we explore and like as t.s Eliot says the end of our exploring is to come back from where we started and to really know the place for the first time well i think that's a great place for us to end um it'll be hard to come back down to earth after this conversation and go do regular life things like <laughs> um but <laughs> Sarah Stewart Johnson, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Oh, Marina, thanks for having me. This was really fun. And thank you to the Aspen Ideas Festival for having us here. And of course, thank you to everyone watching and for joining us.